Welcome to another episode of WPPM podcast, Wind Power Project Management Master's Program at Campus Gotland Uppsala University. And we are very happy to have Remco here. Uh, Remco, without further ado, can you give us a little bit about your background? Yes, well, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, having me here. It's always a privilege to be, uh, to be at Gotland University here, uh, Uppsala University in Gotland. Uh, my background is a legal one. I studied uh, international law at Leiden University, did a postgraduate year in computers and law, and then moved into legal practice as, a, as an attorney in the Netherlands, then legal counsel for a number of Dutch companies, and head of the legal unit at the public-private partnership division within the Ministry of Finance. From then on, I moved into renewable energy. Uh, in those days, 2007, 2008, that was still uh, very much a nascent industry. Uh, required a lot of subsidies, uh, small installations, um, but it was taking off just just basically. Uh, and you you learn by doing. And we still need a lot of contracts to be put in place. And you also needed to create what I call partnerships uh, to make you know, long term contracts. I think in all in all ways are in fact a partnership. And everybody needs to have a certain comfort with that long term relationship. And that was very much the challenge in the beginning, uh, to find the right players who were willing uh, to take that extra step to enter into these long-term agreements. And nowadays, uh, many projects make sense even without subsidies. Many standard agreements are there. Uh, the banks are comfortable with, with the technology, etc. So now it's a matter of scaling up. But in those days, it was very much fiddling around with clauses and solutions to... Uh, to reach contract close and financial close. Yeah, it was some kind of trial and error, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, mm. let's talk about contracts and risk allocation. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, the for that question, the the I mean the whole basics of contracting is allocating risks. Mm -hmm. And there are basically three fields of risks if you talk about a developer uh, on the one hand and a contractor on the other. Um you have risks which the developer can manage, you know, like the financing and things like that. Um, you have risks which a contractor can can manage, like the construction risks, the supply chain, etc. And you have risks which neither of them can manage, like force majeure risks. And those you have to foresee a solution for in some way, have be it termination or insurance, or those kinds of issues. So that's basically the categorization, and it's always a bit of juggling at the end, who takes which risks and, and to what extent. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about challenges and hot topics in okay. contracting. Right. Um, I think that the major challenges are, are uh, not so much in the construction and technique nowadays. Um, um, it's more about what you've seen, for instance, with offshore wind at the moment, that the prices are rising and have risen quite considerably. And if you look, for instance, at the latest tender of the United in the United Kingdom, there were no bidders. There were just no bidders, and that, of course, is something which uh, which is not a good development. Um, so that's, I think, a very very much a challenge for the offshore wind industry and uh, the rising costs. Uh, you see that to a certain extent onshore as well, but I think there the big issue at the moment, at least in our European region, is is the permitting. Uh, the the not in my backyard syndrome in combination with grid congestion um, is definitely uh, slowing down uh, growth of wind onshore. Whereas in the contracting, in all honesty, is not you know the standards are basically there. Um, I don't I don't think the problems lie there nowadays. Okay, but um, what happened after pandemic? Well, uh, <laughs> well the pandemic certainly s slowed a few things down and especially because the supply chains got disrupted um, many players all of a sudden had to look at a force majeure clauses mm -hmm. uh, which until that day um, were mostly pretty kind of boilerplate clauses pretty standard clauses being used in one contract after the other um, and it, it, it was quite a challenge of course for uh, for the industry I think to uh, to deal with the supply chain issues on the one hand 
um, whereas construction, etc., uh, was became quite a bit more difficult as well. Right? Like like so many industries, it had a very negative impact. Um, uh, I am not aware of, of companies which uh, which went bankrupt, but I know of quite a few projects which which got delayed uh, and were no longer delivered on time. Okay. With all costs involved. Okay. Next question. What are the key contractual relationships between different stakeholders, um, for example, developers, utilities, landowners, in a wind energy project, and how are they structured to ensure project success? Wow. Um, to start with the utilities, I mean, they're... Um, with utilities, I, I would I would want to replace the word by off takers. Uh, who's who's buying the power, mm -hmm. uh, and that that can indeed be a utility, but it can also be a private entity. Uh, we have uh, players like Google uh, and, and Microsoft entering into direct agreements with wind farms, like behind the meter. Um, some are behind the meter, indeed, very mm -hmm. good, um, and some are what they call sleeved PPAs, so they still go via the public grid, and they have financial mechanisms. To, uh, to deal with the differences in pricing when you put it on the grid and take it off the grid, to put it yeah. very simple. Um, so that's, that's the part of the income stream, the money coming in, um, and the, the mechanisms for the contracts going out. I think you have, of course, the landowners. Um, either the developer owns the land or has an agreement in place for a duration uh, which at least matches, of course, the, the, the duration of the power purchase agreement. Uh, and it should, of course, be a agreement which is far and solid enough uh, for the banks to finance it. And uh, there should be no other land users or there should be an agreement with them um, giving priority al always to the uh, wind farm. Uh, and, of course, uh, th the last group will be your suppliers. Uh, you mm -hmm. have to have fixed price contracts with them in order to make the whole financing possible or at least a, an indexation so that you know how how the pricing evolves but you cannot have any open end contract yeah okay how do you navigate the regulatory and uh, permitting process for wind energy projects and how do these processes impact project financing uh, quite a bit um especially onshore i would say onshore uh of oh, sorry excuse me offshore you will have the government tendering projects um so they will be responsible basically for the permit for that particular offshore location. Uh, although you have to apply for the end permit depending on the design which you come up with. Onshore uh, is more difficult nowadays because you have various communities and groups, interest groups, which all can influence the project uh, to some extent. And that's definitely something you will need to manage. Um, objections uh, against any permit provided um, now take a lot of time and there are ways of mitigating it in a way by allowing uh, others to also invest within the community etc uh, but but you usually cannot make everybody happy yeah okay next question can you provide insights into the due diligence process that investors typically undertake when considering financing and wind energy project, well, that's that's quite a uh, quite a process. Uh, usually, it has to be with projects of a certain size. Uh, so this usually refers. You can either have a uh, uh, most most larger projects on non recourse finance as project finance, and you will have a very lengthy due diligence process on all different aspects, so all legal aspects, uh, administrative law, the permits, uh, grid connection, etc. On the one hand. The contracts uh, with your contractors, your wind turbine supplier, uh, the service and availability agreement, etc., uh, and then the uh, the financing will also, of course, look into your offtake agreement. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the whole range, all contracts that are of importance to the project that will be investigated, and you will also have technical advisors looking at uh, at at doing a technical due diligence, the combination of the turbine and the wind reports. Uh, so it's, it's it's quite a lengthy process. Okay. And uh, next question is, 
How do changes in interest rates and energy market dynamics affect the financing of wind energy projects? And mm-hmm. how can developers adapt to these changes? There's, there's a lot in that question. It's a good mm-hmm. question. Um, well, first of all, Im- interest rates, of course, have a negative influence on, on the projects. Uh, the costs go up. And what you see now uh, at the moment is, of course, that in markets where intermittency is becoming more and more of an issue uh, with solar and wind coming online, uh, it becomes more difficult to provide certainty on the income stream end on the one hand, getting a long-term fixed power purchase agreement, whereas on the other hand, your costs are going up. Yeah. So it, it, it uh, what I see at the moment is that it hasn't become easier, to put it mildly, to develop these projects. What developers can do is is maybe twofold. I mean, of course, on the one hand, uh, it's an easy one, I'm afraid, is, is reduce costs in some other way. Um, but with higher interest rates, there's o- only so, so far you can go. Uh, and on the other hand, you may require some more creativity on the income stream side. Uh, some more of these corporate power purchase agreements could help. Um, maybe some agreements uh, behind the meter, uh, delivering power to a large off-taker. Uh, that also resolves uh, the grid connection issue. But then you will, you will ha- it will have to be a sizable off-taker uh, in relation to the wind farm. Yeah. Okay, and... Uh, <coughs> Uh, I have another question, like, um, what role does community engagement and public perception play in securing financing for wind energy projects, and how can developers address community concerns effectively? Mm. Well, over the years, I mean, the, the involvement of communities uh, in a negative way has, has become much greater. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's there's a uh, well the, the, what we call the the NIMBY approach uh, the yep. not in my backyard is becoming ever more powerful. That also I think has to do with the p- turbines becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, yep. and w- and w- I'm mostly talking onshore now, in particular, and it requires engagement from a very early stage. And the permitting process may have such an impact that. Developers are now looking at locations which from a wind perspective are less attractive, Mm -hmm. but from a permitting perspective are more attractive. Because at the end of the day, these objections to permits can really delay a project. Um, So I I do see developers move to areas where, uh, where this can become less of an issue. Okay. Our students right now are thinking about their thesis topics. So is there any hot trend and topic that they can choose? Uh, yes, I'm sure there are. Um, I think one of them is, is circularity. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was something that was not taken into account in the very beginning of the industry. But at the time, that was f- far less of an issue. Uh, are, you, uh, are you able to recycle components at the end of life? Uh, what amount of energy is used? producing the wind turbines. And so the whole circularity aspect, I think, is a, is a very important one. Uh, what I read most about is the blades, and those are probably the most difficult yep. to, uh, to find or reuse, uh, to, to find a, a way to recycle or repurpose or some other thing. And the intermittency is becoming more and more of an issue in markets where you have more and more wind and solar coming online. Uh, it becomes more and more difficult for the grid to, abs- for the market, the power market, to absorb these kinds of intermittent volumes. And when the wind blows, there's a lot. When the sun shines, there's a lot. When neither of them is there, there's nothing. Yeah. Uh, so how to deal with that, either through storage or uh, operating the turbines in a different manner, or indeed uh, generating hydrogen, uh, those are things which I think we're very much worthwhile looking at now for the developed markets. For the underdeveloped markets, where there's still very little wind and solar, uh, I, I think it would be very much something to look into the policies. Why are these markets not served yet, if the potential is there? Yeah. Okay. And my last question. So 
you know this program since like 2015, right? Correct. This master's program, it's uh, one of a kind and it's yes. mixing like technical aspects to social aspects. Um, so do you have any word with the students of the program or people who are thinking about actually choosing this program? I don't, to be honest, no. No, I, d I don't know many people with the right background, with the technical background who are studying at the moment, who I, would re who I could recommend it to. I would if I could. Mm -hmm. There'd be no doubt about that. And I think it, uh, what I've seen over the years is that it, it attracts a very, uh, very highly motivated group of, of students. And if I follow them on LinkedIn, they all uh, more or less end up in the industry in good positions. Yep. So obviously the program clearly has an added value. Uh, so if, if I could recommend it to anybody with the right background, I, I certainly would, definitely. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for this interesting and very important topic. Thank you for your time. Pleasure to be here.